Assalamu alaikum. In this episode of Honesty Talk, we're going to kind of go back to a topic that we briefly um, visited in season one, and that was uh, parenting. And we kind of want to uh, dig a little, little bit deeper, become a little bit more specific, and that is raising teens, mm-hmm. particularly raising teens in the West. Um, gosh, okay, so... Uh, Layinka and I are both mothers of teenagers. It's Maya in a few years, inshallah. And um, uh, it's uh, it, it's a heavy topic. Mm. It's a heavy topic. As parents who chose to become Muslim, practice the deen, we have certain ideals. Right for our children, we want them to be better than us. I think that's just that's just across the board. Mm-hmm. We want our children to be better than us. We want them to practice Islam. We want them to succeed spiritually, financially. You know all the elus. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Mm-hmm. Um, but what happens when a teenager loses their way? What happens when a teenager chooses other than what you spent years raising them upon. Um, that's kind of like maybe the extreme, but also how do, how do we as parents navigate, um, navigate the, their journeys of choosing other than what we are upholding for ourselves? And that could be something such as music, it could be company, it could be it could be you know a variety of things essentially how do we uh navigate this journey of raising teens in the west so this is what we're bringing to the table so layinka you have a 17 year old seven at the time of recording yes. 17 and 14 and a half okay mashallah and i have a 16 year old and an almost 13 year old mm. um and we both have a boy it's, they're both boy and girl mm. right so I don't know about you, but for me, there's a great deal of fear, okay? Um, I was living in um, North Africa for almost six years, and that was a completely different... I know that we spoke about this in the break, that you were a teenager in a Muslim country. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we, we can speak about that. There were certain fears that I had living there, now that I'm back living in the UK, I'm 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 terrified by certain things. I'm I'm really scared. I want to protect my 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 kids. I I want to try to um, to parent them in the way that they make the right choices. Um, and I'm, I'm I keep hearing and seeing stories of teenagers of practicing Muslim families who have stop praying, who have declared themselves to be agnostics, atheists, who have adopted certain ways of life that are in complete um, contradiction to to the teachings of of our belief. And it can happen to any of us, Mm -hmm. okay? Just because we are by default practicing doesn't mean that we will not be tested with our children and many are. And so this is something that I, I, feel, I feel we really need to bring to the table. We have already been promised that we'll be tested with our children. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's a given. Mm-hmm. So it's to be expected. In some shape or form. In some mm-hmm. shape or form, we'll be tested with our children. For me, I found that, you know, being a teen, the mother of teens for a while, so my eldest is currently 17, He's embarking on the, he's on the cusp of adulthood, Mm -hmm. right? In terms of being 18 and 
yeah. what that means in society. Because <laughs> in my eyes, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but having been on the journey with him and my journey now with his sister, who's a couple of years behind, I find that with him, it was with fear. And with her, it's not. Mm. And I've chosen not to adopt fear because that led me to shut down conversations and to not and not get curious about what he wanted, what he desired and how we can come to conclusions together and navigate it together to support him and empower him to make decisions that used his judgment of right and wrong. That's interesting because I use fear to initiate discussion. Yeah. So for me, mm. the fact that I have that fear and I want to, to do everything I can to keep them upon the dean, upon principles and, and morals and so on. For me, it's the same fear. But that, it's manifested differently. Right. Yeah. So I, I, I'm changing the way that I communicate. I communicate more. I speak openly and candidly about everything. Everything. Mm -hmm. And it's needed. Yeah, so that's, that's really absolutely. interesting. For, for me, the fear, mm. for me, fear shut it down. Mm, for me, you know, fear it has opened me up. Yeah, yeah. it didn't, it didn't help. Um, and, and I guess I'm glad that we have that, that duality, mm -hmm. because then people can see that right. it's not just one that's right and one that's wrong. Absolutely. It manifests differently for each individual. Mm. And for me, it manifested in shutting down. Mm. Now, with my um, eldest daughter, it, it's not fear. It's compassion and curiosity. Mm. I want to understand how you're thinking and feeling. You know, maybe also in terms of development, in terms of my own knowledge and work and things like that, that has led to a different, mm. you know, uh, um, way of dealing with it and, and coming to the table with them. But, you know, there's something really special about creating safe spaces for teens. Yes. So Naima and I, my friend Naima and I, we, uh, last year we took our kids on a weekend away and we all we both had teens so it was really it was nice to have like a house full of teens and we decided to establish a safe space with them and we said right here in this room is a safe space so whatever is said in this space doesn't come out of this space so know that whatever you share here we ain't gonna kill you afterwards. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Weapons down. Right. Mm -hmm. And we started asking them some questions. So I had created some cards that I'd used to, to ask some questions. And it was interesting to hear what was going on in their minds. Mm -hmm. Like a question that was, if there was anything that you didn't have, you had a choice not to do in the Dean, what would it be? Mm -hmm. And for them to say things like praying, Obviously, our hearts are like, Allah. <laughs> right? But for them to be open yeah. and share that and for us to get curious, tell us more about that. Mm. What is going? What is the struggle and the challenge there for them? Because most of us don't approach our teens like that. Mm. Allah qala rasul. There's no discussion. Accept. You just do it. Mm. But what it is, nahnu sami'na wa ata'na. We mm. accept. We mm. obey. But they have yet to come to that point within themselves that it's we hear and we obey mm -hmm. within themselves we hear and we do it because mom says mm -hmm. dad says we should do it mm -hmm. but not because of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I think we said it in that parenting they episode to choose Islam for that they, they have, have to choose, to choose Islam, Islam, Islam for, for themselves, themselves. Yeah. and it's hard for us as moms of you know mothers and fathers parents to watch that because that could mean them straying mm -hmm. that could mean them going in, in an opposite direction while you're clutching your, your chest mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and hitting the, 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 that sujood hard mm -hmm. because you feel like they're never going to make their way back. Mm -hmm. But who's to say, especially for all of us here, we've been on our journeys mm -hmm. and Allah has brought us. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Yeah. I think, I think um, when I think about uh Teenagers who have chosen other than Islam or chosen other practices um, which their parents do not approve of Islamically. I don't know. Uh, for me, with now two teenagers, I have had to... There are certain things that I... That I ha, 
I didn't accept to be Islamic. I raised my children, teaching them that this was un-Islamic, that this is not pleasing to Allah, that you should not do this. Mm -hmm. And now what I've had to do is I've had to review society. Mm -hmm. I've had to review the people that they're coming into contact with. I've had to review the trends that are taking place. I've had to review that this is a world of social media. Mm -hmm. And so what I've had to do, and this is just me, I'm not saying that anyone should do this and this is like, you know, this is what I've I've done is that I've had to, I've had to look at compromising certain things for my children, whereby by doing so, they're not then going to feel like they ha they can only do that when mum isn't around. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, we as adults, as adults that have chosen Islam, you know, we we will engage in things that are not pleasing to Allah. Yeah. Right? So what about our teenagers who have yet to choose Islam for themselves? That there's a greater pull there. So for me, I I I have, um, I have got to a point where I had to do certain things with my teens that when they were little, I couldn't imagine. <laughs> yeah, never, unimaginable. Yeah. But but you know what? By by doing those things with them, it's they, they, there's there's no longer this this pull and that need of secrecy and that yes. need for secrecy. I want them to feel. Um, uh, comfortable enough to live as a believing young person within the West without having to do anything behind my back um, and to, to, to basically you know it's we're at a point now let's be real we're at we're at a point where if your teenager is Muslim and prays you better be on that prayer mat thanking Allah. That's where we're at. Yeah. Let's let's not let's not try to 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 make it pretty. Mm -hmm. This is what we're dealing with now. Mm -hmm. It's not you know you know like back in the day like maybe like 10 20 years ago it was you know the aspirations were higher, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know the aspirations were higher. Now it was it was like it was like you know yeah ma mashallah you know you push your child to 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 pray the 12 rawatib, you know they they're memorizing Quran and and these these aspirations are important. Mm -hmm. But now we're at a point where Subhanallah, there, there's a, um, um, a, a sister's uh, son who, just by going on YouTube, he was watching videos of debates between atheists and Muslims, and it shook his faith. Mm. It completely shook his faith. Alhamdulillah, he had a healthy enough relationship with his parents to say, I'm not sure about this. Help me. Help me. Right, this that is, right there is beautiful. Right. You could do that. But then what, what creates that? What cultivates that level of relationship where your child feels safe enough to come and say, I've got an issue with, with my belief. I'm not sure if I accept this. I'm not sure if I believe this. But you know, if you are that practicing parent that's, you better, yeah, no. Harshness. Mm. Do you know what? I've seen this time and time again. Well, if, if your teenagers are out there in society, and they will be, they're going to rebel. Every teenager rebels. Mm. Whether you're Muslim, you're non-Muslim, you're practicing, you're not practicing, they will rebel. Mm. We don't want our children to rebel in matters of the deen. Mm. So maybe we need to look, rather than look at changing them and, and, and making it stricter and tighter, and mm, 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 maybe we need to open the door. And we need to change the way we communicate. We need to say, we need to, to, to ask ourselves, am I listening? Mm -hmm. am, I, am I creating a safe enough space? Mm -hmm. Yeah, That safety is massive. And I think also looking at what is it ultimately that they need and seek mm -hmm. when they're doing those things, usually it's to fit in and mm -hmm. to belong and to know that they matter. Mm -hmm. If a child in their home feel like they don't belong, they're not seen, they're not heard and they don't matter, they will seek it outside. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hearing you guys, um, I, I, what really stuck out for me was that duality between the, you know, the really practicing home and then having a second life outside 
outside of home and how um, there's almost a, in a lot of cases, especially people who are c cross cultural, um, parents are not from the West necessarily. These are conversations that are not going to be had. Yes. My parents would kill me. Like there's no way we could ever talk about this at home. It just has to be handled in secret. And they kind of come to this uh, decision. That's it. Um, and also what you said about propping the kids up and having this, the young Muslim family. And, and my, my observation is that um, in, in the Muslim community, we romanticize the ideal Muslim home. We like to, mashallah, mm -hmm. the videos of the young mm -hmm. children with the kufis reading Quran <laughs> with daddy. And we play these things back. We like, we think it's cute and we want to kind of keep our eyes on that. We want to compare our kids to that, but we're not being realistic mm -hmm. about the fact that, okay, things are going to be grisly. There's serious conversations. There are things that, you know, a 13 and 14 year old girl is going through if she can't talk to her mom about that stuff where is she going because she left the house in abe in a scarf that's not what she's wearing mm. like the, these the parents the parents have to be in a position to talk about these things and and as a parent looking at my children to remember that i was a teenager too and what it felt like to be lectured mm. and what it felt like to be controlled mm. and and how, um, how that wasn't necessarily a good experience for me. How did it make me feel to be in that position and to put my, I understand the intent behind it, at, at that fear and wanting to protect and that you have something at stake in the outcome for your child, but you know, just having the compassion because we talk about having compassion for, for adults, like you said, mm. like people make mistakes, people go through ups and downs in their faith, people sometimes may not be on it and, but with, what about with our with our kids? I think it's the fear that if I give them a little slack, they'll completely, you know, go yeah. off the rails. No, it's it's a balance, and I think um, as a parent, it's like as a, as a as a practicing parent, you know, you 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 interact with your 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 teenager, knowing what's better, you know. But when but with a teen, I, I, I have found in my own experience, particularly with my eldest, with my daughter that when I have communicated with her from a position of learning from her, valuing her opinion, sharing with her my own vulnerabilities, my own struggles, and asking her opinion, right? She comes through. She, she <laughs> We underestimate them. She comes through. And then she, as a result of that, shares shares her vulnerabilities. But if we are presenting ourselves to our teenagers as unmade, mm -hmm. I know it, khalas. I don't do those things. No. Mm. How can they come to us? But when you say, you know what? I'm struggling with this. And, and, and I'm going through this. And you know, what do you think about? That's, that's an open invitation to do the same. It's like a mirror, right? Mm -hmm. So I think it's it's, when we, when, we, when we think about parenting teens, we think about what do I need to do with them? Mm. But actually, what do you need to do with yourself mm. as a parent of a teen? Mm. How do you need to change the way you are speaking, how you are approaching, how you are, you know, or, and, and it, it starts with us. Mm. And it's, it's not easy, you know, subhanAllah. There's, it's not easy. There are tears in the prayer mat. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> ya Allah, Ya Allah, Ya Allah. I think the thing that comes to mind too is shame. Shame for the parents. Like I've, I've gotten messages where it's like, you know, I have a teenager who's doing one, two, three, mm -hmm. and I don't know what to do with them. It's not that. It's the we're a practicing family. Mm. We're good people. I raised them to know better. Like there's a very, we have an image to uphold here and they're really messing that up for us with the way that they're behaving. It's not, how can I be there for my child? It's they're making me look bad. Mm -hmm. And it's a different question. Mm -hmm. It's a different question. So I think by normalizing it, and like you said, the sister who faced the predicament withdrew because she can read already how she's gonna be met. Mm -hmm. The community around her who judged other people's children for being, out of control or unruly are going to eat her alive when it's her turn. So she knows this is not an environment 
where she can even get support or share. The judgment bar is so high. We're all pretending our kids are perfect. So how are you going to talk about struggling with yours? But you know right there what you said about when someone is saying they're tarnishing our image. You're not even thinking about the team. No, you're not at all. At, at all. all. You've completely dismissed their humanity. You've completely dismissed their needs and wants and desires. You've completely dismissed that they are their own person, really and truly. And as a son of or a daughter of Adam, they have free will, mm -hmm. right? And you're worried about your image. Mm -hmm. That's very, that's a, that's not the best position to take. Mm -hmm. Take yourself out of the picture and the shame that of people talking, what people are going to say, mm -hmm. and look at that teenager as another human being mm -hmm. and come from a place of curiosity. I know people are tired of me saying that. Curiosity, because when you do, you ask questions. Mm -hmm. You don't start lecturing. Mm -hmm. you, get, you seek to understand. And when you seek to understand what you might discover about your child might be something you've never known about them before, mm. even though they've been living under your roof for so long. Mm. You connect with them, but then they also finally are able to know that they've been seen. Mm. So she's seen me, like, wow. And that there can be the thing that, op that cracks open the doors that have been previously locked, mm. that then they can start to share their own vulnerabilities, that they can start to, you know, um, to, to say what their fears are. Because I know in me, um, navigating, for instance, the, the realm of hijab with my, elder, with my eldest daughter and the, the struggles, I remember taking her out for a walk. And I, I find when it comes to talking to teens, yeah. don't sit in front of them. No. <laughs> Stare them down. No. Don't do that. I do that, yeah. Go I, in the I car take them, I take and drive. Walk. Yeah. Yeah. Or go for a walk so you're not having eye to eye That's contact right. like that because that is yeah. actually very, very intimidating. intimidating. Mm -hmm. They will they will not talk jack to you. <laughs> yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. But when we're walking now, I was like, okay, I can say whatever I want and she's not gonna stay yeah, me down. Off. <laughs> yeah. Into the right? distance. So I took her out on a walk and I said, Tell me, what is going on for you? And what she shared that I wanna just fit in. I wanna be normal. Mm. That is a real need. Now we can say, well, we're not, the, we are the Ghoraba, yeah. you know, we are not meant to be. But actually, she goes to a mainstream school. She's part of mainstream society. She feels different. And as a person, as a, as a child who feels different, they just want to be accepted. Mm. Yeah. Right. Mm. And so I could come to her and approach her and her desire for expression or whatever from that place of understanding mm -hmm. rather than that imposing yes i know what allah dictates mm -hmm. that's her journey though mm -hmm. because i've been on mine i wasn't wearing hijab from when i was born mm -hmm. right yeah. i've been on my journey i've been on my journey to come to this point and knowing that she needs to navigate that and i'm there to be her her partner mm -hmm. i'm not i'm not the captain of the ship mm -hmm. as much as we like to think as parents yeah, that we are yeah. there's actually, a stage after which <laughs> there's yeah. a stage where we have to step back and they have to take control and we are advising we are asking we are questioning we are um, probing trying to understand injecting where we can you know i think it's important to remember the 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 main objective as well yes because i think we lose sight of that and the main objective is that allah as a has entrusted you with these these um these children and you know you're there to guide them but ultimately you're there to guide them to what to simply become practicing because you want to be seen by by mm -hmm. society that you've done a good job no the objective is that you're saving yourself and your family from the hellfire. <laughs> it's as simple as that. You are wanting to go to Jannah. You are wanting to worship Allah. Mm. Now, with that objective in mind, there's going to be slip ups along the way. Mm. There's going to be, it's not a straight line. It's not, it's not a straight road. You know, there are, there are curves, there are bumps, there are dips, ups and there downs. are ups and downs. Yeah. So it's not about, it's not about making your team the perfect Muslim. Mm. It's, and, and they never will be, and neither are we. <laughs> neither are we as adults. It's about, um, it's about helping them as, as they come across the bumps, as they come across the, the, the dips, and 
uh, trying to do everything you can to keep them on that road to Allah. Mm. And that, that, that's why you've got to review as you go along. Mm. You know, it's, it, I can only use the analogy of like a journey, like a, literally a car journey. You've got to stop. Mm. You've got to, you know, you've got to, you've got to switch off the engine. Mm. You know, you've got to look at the map again. Am I going in the right way? You've got to uh, fuel, fuel them, fuel yourself. There's, there's so much that you need to do. It's not just simply... Going. Go, and, go, and go. they will make mistakes. Of course they will. And it's how do we help them to navigate those mistakes? Mm-hmm. Do we shame them? Mm-hmm. Uh, you're going to hell hellfire. Don't you know Allah hates this? Yes, remind them about what Allah loves and what Allah hates. I, hippie. <laughs> <laughs> Disclaim. <laughs> I like to remind them of what Allah loves. Mm. Because he talks about his mercy so much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He loves when you return to him. He loves when you seek his face. Yes, you have made a mistake and he's seen you make that mistake. I might not have even seen you make that mistake. He loves when you turn back to him and to remind them because I parented, I know I parented my two eldest very much from a place of shame, sh- shame mm. when they were younger, mm. shame and and, and mm. fear Allah, mm. fear Allah. Mm. Like, strike that fear of Allah in there. It's haram, kind of thing. SubhanAllah. But then, where was teaching him actually teaching them about Allah's love? Mm. Al Wadud, mm. Al Rahman, Al Rahim, mm. right? And coming from that place. And so now, Hippi Liyinka mm. is, is, is able to see, okay, you, you are going to make mistakes. Heck, you're going to fall flat on your face. Mm. Don't despair. Mm. Just allow yourself to pick yourself up, take the lessons mm-hmm. and turn back to him. Mm-hmm. At least istighfar, tawbah. You know what you have done. And it's always funny, my eldest always like, yeah, mom, you know, I, I, make, <laughs> I, make, I make istighfar every day. Mm-hmm. I'm like, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it's also important that obviously the com- their company has an effect upon them. Absolutely. And I think it's important for us to bring that company into our home. Thank you. I always say that to my son. Okay. Bring them over. Bring, Let me see come. their face. But we, but for, no, but, but, but for them to chill, for them to do their thing within. And you know what? I know a lot of Muslim parents are like, oh, no, 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 but, you know, that person isn't practicing. Oh, that person isn't Muslim. Bad. Bring them. No, no. Bring them. Bring them. Mm -hmm. Bring them. Subhanallah, when I became Muslim, so I became Muslim through my friend who was completely practicing, mashallah, and she brought me into her home. You know, Bengali family, mom and dad, you know, barely spoke English. And I used to sit and eat curry. And, you know, she brought me in. And that... That obviously had an impact on me. Mm. But you see, if we were to look at look at it now, you would think, oh, you know, some some crazy mixed race girl, you know, like hanging with uh, Where's she gonna drag know, her daughter? Yeah, where's she gonna drag her daughter? But mm. no, bringing me in, obviously that opened my heart to Islam. Mm. Um, and I think it's really important that, that we, that our teenagers feel, essentially, we need to parent them in a way that they feel comfortable enough to be themselves as they navigate this choice to choose Islam for themselves Mm. in all of its highs and lows. Mm. And we've got, you know what? We have to, and deal. And do our own work. I mean, when I'm listening to you guys talk about um, coming from a curious place and being kind of more in a supportive role, uh, a story came to mind from about two years ago uh, of a mom with a teenage daughter um, who the, the daughter basically went through like a teen pregnancy and came back to the mom's home. Um, and when I, I hadn't seen her in years or her mom. And so when I saw them, the mom is kind of filling me in on what happened over the last few years and the daughter's there. And the mom is so deep in the shame, mm-hmm. like in the way that she's telling the story, you know, we're trying to marry her off. We're trying to like, we're trying to, we're trying to save this. We're trying to fix it. But nowhere in what she's saying is there anything about the daughter going through this and not having support and being heartbroken and discarded. And so she's she's a client for Haven herself, the daughter. Mm-hmm. And the mom is way off base because the mom is not in a place, like you said, like we want them to be themselves and be real and be over the shame. But the mom is not even in a place where she's that herself. Yeah. So she can't offer that to her daughter. Right. So it goes back to us as parents 
getting to a place where we're over the judgment and we're over and we're doing our work, then we can hold space for our kids. Practical, practical suggestions, like really, really practical things that you can do as you raise a teen. Just remember you were a teenager once mm. and mm. cut them some slack. <laughs> oh, they're going to love you. <laughs> it's true, though. It's true. It's true. Yeah, I, think it's I, I always say the importance of having safe spaces mm. and having those one on one walks, those yes, one on one outings, those, those road trips, those trips for dessert. Mm -hmm. Just with, because we think that when they're teenagers, they don't need us, but they really, really they do. do. They really, really do. But they're trying to navigate the space of being independent. Um, and teens <laughs> and grown, um, but they do need us. Yeah. And to, to create that in our lives and in their lives, I think yeah. that would be yeah. beautiful. I echo what you said. Um, uh, what, I, what, I, what I do is I actually schedule in a one-on-one -on -one time with each of my children where, and it could just be something as simple as I need to get milk <laughs> from the shop. Come, let's go, let's go. And I'm talking to them, I'm consciously talking, speaking, you know, anything that they said during the week, you know, I, I, I'll, I'll raise it or, you know, and and that one on one time is is crucial. Um, the other thing is, obviously, without a shadow of a doubt, dua, you know, for you know, our dua is answered, our dua as mothers, as mustajab, um, to, to, to be very specific in the dua that we're making for, mm. our, for our teenagers. And, um, and the third thing I would suggest is communication and what i mean by communication is not just you speaking and them listening but them talking and you listening about everything no taboo the, yeah everything's on the table. everything is on the table and when they speak that you reserve judgment because you know what if your teenager can share their struggles with you that is, that's like a step in the right yeah, direction. Yeah, it's half the battle. That's it. And they're on that, they're on that, they're in that car. They're ready to switch the engine on and carry it on, inshallah. Yeah. Please do share your tips and suggestions in, about raising teens, how we can um, navigate that, that part of uh, the parenting journey. And um, we'll see you over at the next episode of Honesty Talk, inshallah. The thing about grief is that often it's a lonely journey. I couldn't understand how someone could become that distraught over the death of an animal. Grief around death is more socially like acceptable um, than other uh, cases where we grieve for an idea or for something that didn't come into fruition. No one truly gets it within you, what that and how much that thing, person, dream meant to you. You know, I'm really hurting, you know, and Allah who gave it to you knows that you're hurting. I said I would not cry in this season, isn't it? Because I didn't cry in the last two seasons. So yeah, so what does that patience look like? It can look like having a really hard time. <laughs> it means a lot to them because of what it signified. Everyone's response to grief is different and everyone's experience of grief is different. Mm -hmm.